Hello everyone, let's talk about the basic behaviors of waves. In this video, I will introduce to you some of the common and basic behaviors you will come across for all types of waves. This includes reflection of waves, refraction, diffraction, and wave superposition. Keep in mind that this video is merely an introduction to these behaviors. I will talk about each of these behaviors in more detail when it comes to specific types of waves such as sound and light later in the module. As you should know from my introduction video to waves, a wave refers to when energy is transmitted from one location to another. In the case of mechanical waves, this transmission will require medium, and in the case of electromagnetic waves, it only relies on the oscillation of electric and magnetic fields which do not require medium. Now, when this transmission of energy reaches the boundary of two media or two different materials, one of a few things can happen. This wave can be absorbed by the new medium at the boundary between the two media, in which case the energy of the wave is usually transformed into a different form and is stored inside the new material. The wave can be reflected whereby it changes direction and starts propagating away from the new medium. And the third thing that can happen is that the wave can be transmitted through the new medium, which allows the continuation of the transmission of energy through this new medium. I discuss the absorption of waves at a much later stage of the HSC physics syllabus. For the sake of simplicity, I will only discuss when a wave is either reflected or transmitted through the boundary between two media. Let's talk about reflection. Reflection is when the incoming or incident wave bounces off the surface or boundary between two media. Reflection of a wave always obeys the law of reflection, which simply states that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection or the reflected angle. These two angles can only be recognized by drawing a normal vector that is a perpendicular line to the boundary between two media. The angle of incidence refers to the angle between the propagation direction of the incoming wave and the normal vector that we've just drawn. So this angle here is the angle of incidence. Similarly, the angle of reflection is created between the normal vector and the propagation direction of the reflected wave. In reflection, these two angles must always be equal. The two angles can only be better visualized by drawing the propagation direction of the wave as an arrow. This is commonly used to help us understand these behaviors of waves by using the ray diagram of waves. The ray diagram of waves is especially helpful and beneficial for us to visualize the direction of travel or where the energy is being transmitted to for waves. While the law of reflection always is upheld, the extent to which the reflection of waves occurs depends on the type of wave that's involved and the type of surface on which the wave is to be reflected off. For example, mirrors normally prevent the transmission of an incoming light wave and is designed to be completely flat such that all of the incoming incident waves will be reflected in the same direction to create a very clear image. Reflection of mirrors is a perfect scenario to understand the reflection of light waves. However, this is not always true. In the case of mirrors or any flat surface or boundary between two media, the normal vector at all points of the flat boundary can be drawn in the same direction because the surface and boundary is flat. This means if the incoming incident light rays are all traveling in the same direction, then all of their respective reflected light rays will be traveling in the same direction as well. This is what we call specular reflection, which will create a very clear image like the one we'll see in the mirror of ourselves. However, like I alluded to, this is often not the case. Most often the boundary between two media is not perfectly flat like mirrors, they are often rough or uneven. Reflection of such surfaces will lead to diffuse reflection because the normal vector drawn at various points at the boundary are not in the same direction as we saw in a flat surface. This means despite the instant light rays coming towards the boundary in the same direction being parallel, the reflected light rays are not traveling in the same direction. 
This means diffuse reflection will often lead to a very unclear image, or no image at all for us to visualize. It is very important for you to be aware and understand that in both specular and diffuse reflection, even though the normal vectors are drawn in different directions, the law of reflection is true in both cases, where the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection, as you can see here. In both cases, it doesn't matter what normal vector is drawn, the angle of incidence should be equal to the angle of reflection. Now, sometimes the surface can be smooth, but it doesn't need to be flat. We can have reflection of what we call concave or convex surfaces or boundaries between two media. In these cases, reflection also obeys the law of reflection. So if we draw the normal vector at various points of these concave and convex boundaries, you will also see that the angle of incidence should be equal to the angle of reflection. Now I will discuss reflection of curve boundaries in its own video later on in the module under the section of light waves. Now remember, when a wave encounters a boundary between two media, it doesn't always get reflected. Sometimes the wave can be transmitted through the boundary and continue its propagation into the new medium. When this occurs, what's likely to happen when the wave travels in the new medium is the behavior of reflection. Reflection is the bending of this wave as it transmits through the boundary and enters the new medium. You can better understand and visualize this behavior by using a ray diagram of a wave. The blue ray represents the incident wave which travels through and reaches the boundary between medium one and medium two. And if it transmits to the second medium and passes through the boundary, it becomes what we call a refractor wave, where its velocity or direction of propagation changes compared to the initial one of the incident wave. This change in the direction of propagation after it enters a new medium is the behavior of refraction. Not only does refraction change the speed and the direction, which altogether we refer to as the velocity of the wave, it also changes the wavelength of the wave that is represented by lambda, as we discussed in the introduction to waves. Whether the refractor wave bends towards the normal, which is the perpendicular vector to the boundary between two media, or away from the normal, depends on a property of the medium called the refractive index. And in physics, this is usually represented by the symbol N. In these diagrams, N2 represents the refractive index of the second medium that the wave will be transmitted through, and N1 represents the refractive index of the first medium where the wave came from. If the refractive index of the material that the wave goes into is greater than the initial refractive index of the material where it came from, then the refractor wave will bend towards normal. That is, the angle of refraction between the normal and the new refractor wave will be smaller compared to the angle of incidence, this angle here. Vice versa, if N2 is less than the value of N1, then the refractor wave will bend away from the normal. So the angle of refraction will be greater than the angle of incidence. This relationship between the refractive index and the angle of refraction is described in what we call Snell's law. I talk more about refraction and Snell's law in its own video later on in the module. Now, moving on to the next behavior of wave, known as diffraction. Diffraction occurs when a wave passes through a small opening between two barriers, or when it passes around the edge of a barrier. After a wave goes through a small opening, it starts to scatter outward. So that is, if initially its direction of propagation is going in a linear fashion, after it goes through a small opening or the edge of an object, the direction of propagation starts to branch out in a wider direction. This behavior of wave is called diffraction. Now, what you need to know is that the degree to which diffraction occurs depends on how small this aperture or opening is that the wave has to travel through, and also it depends on the wavelength of the wave that undergoes diffraction. 
Typically, diffraction becomes a lot more obvious when the aperture is smaller than the wavelength of the wave. You can see this relationship between the aperture and the degree of diffraction by looking at these two examples of a water wave transmitting through an opening between two barriers. In both cases, diffraction occurs, as you can see by the scattering effect of the water waves. However, if we make the opening between the two barriers smaller, you can see that the effect of diffraction becomes a lot more apparent. The scattering effect becomes almost like a circle, described as circular waves in this diagram. The last behavior of waves I want to discuss in this video is wave superposition and the concept of interference on waves. Now, very often in real life, we will have multiple waves coming together to a single point and be combined together. The combination of multiple waves and how it produces a resultant wave is known as wave superposition. Now, waves can only be combined, that is, undergo superposition, if they are of the same type. If you have a sound wave meeting a light wave at the same point, then they won't undergo any form of superposition. So you should only consider this behavior when you've got multiple sources of the same type of wave coming together to a single point. At the level of HEC physics, most examples of wave superposition are only considered when the multiple sources of waves were traveling in a linear fashion before they are combined together. The effect of wave superposition is best understood and visualized by using the transverse wave model of waves. Remember, in the transverse wave model, we have the maximum displacement being labeled as crests and the minimum displacement of the wave of oscillation described as troughs. When you have two waves of the same type, if they meet at the point such that the two crests of the wave are at the same position at the same time, and the two troughs of the waves also meet at the same position at the same time, then what's going to happen is constructive interference whereby the amplitude of the two waves are added together to produce one wave where the amplitude of the wave is greater compared to the initial waves. Vice versa, if we have a situation where the crest of one wave meets the trough of the other wave at the same position at the same time, then you can imagine that the crest and trough will negate each other, and if the two waves have exactly the same amplitude, you will actually produce a wave with no oscillation at all. This is what we call destructive interference. Now, unfortunately, wave superposition and interference is quite a difficult topic to fully explore in one introduction video. So make sure you check out its own video for more detail and to further improve your understanding of this behavior. Hey everyone, if you found this video helpful, smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Want even more? Become a Patreon member for early access to videos, exclusive Discord discussions about questions on chemistry and physics, and live preparation sessions for your exams. Don't forget to head over to our website for topic tests and practice exams to further improve your understanding and learning.